Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we begin a new week, and as we return to our study of Samson in Judges 16, as we look for further symbols and for meanings for these symbols, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and for his direction so that we may be more correctly enlightened as to that which he would have us to know for this time in our history. Shall we pray? Loving Father in heaven, as we join together and come before you this morning, we ask you, for your guidance, for your direction, for your blessing, so that as we examine this portion of scripture, we may come into a clearer understanding of that which you would have us to understand at this point. I thank you, Father, for the opportunity that we have to join together in this study. We ask, Father, for your Holy Spirit. We know our great need because the Spirit is one that can enlighten our minds and direct us so that we may more properly understand not only our great need of you and see our sin for what it is, but also so that we may more correctly understand the symbols that are now before us. We have sinned. Our minds are darkened by sin, for we do not always understand. Help us now. Direct this conversation. Be with us in this study. Show us the things that we need to consider and that which we need to understand, prepare us, we ask, mold us into the type of vessel that you can use so that your character will be more properly represented to all with whom we come in contact. For this, Father, we ask, for this guidance and direction, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Okay. When we last were together on Thursday, we were going through the fact that Delilah was the third woman that Samson sought to have a relationship with. The first covenant relationship with the Philistine of Timna resulted in a slaughter <clears throat> because the Philistines chose to burn her father's house and her. The second with the harlot of Gaza resulted in Samson removing the gates of Gaza and then resulted in the death of many Philistines, but also that this happened in front of the men of Judah. Now we have yet to determine exactly who the Philistines are representing or who the men of Judah were representing. We know that Samson is representing a message. We know that there is a message here for the movement at this time. Now we come to Delilah. And to do a quick overview, here we have Samson. We know that the lords of the Philistines came up to her 
and said unto her, Entice him and see where him his great strength lieth, and by which means we may prevail against him, that we may bind him to humble him. And we will give the every one of us 1,100 pieces of silver. Now, as I read this passage, to me it is clear that the lords of the Philistines are each offering 1,100 pieces of silver. When we compared this on Thursday with what Mrs. White had written, there were five lords of the Philistines, each representing a different city. So that would mean that she was being offered 5,500 pieces of silver. Now, there was much that was addressed regarding the number 11. Can, we be, can our minds be refreshed at this point by the symbol of what 1,100 would mean for us? We know that this number is going to occur in the following chapter, which is actually a preceding example. But what does the 1100 symbol mean for us in the movement? Well, the, uh, Stephen had pointed out that 1100, and this doesn't mean a lot to a lot of other people, but um, when we take all the divisors that uh, 1100 has, it adds up to um 2604 okay and of course we know that that's the number of years in the prophetic mirror it's also a symbol of the 26th day of the fourth month which was used to predict july 18th 2020 on the gregorian calendar and um the fact that there are five of these kings offering it um I mean, one of the things that we would we would see is that this represents the five wise, the five foolish, it, or in some way. Um, so, so this eleven hundred, trying to understand who the the Philistines represent in this ironic interpretation that we're using with the symbols. I mean, this is a message dealing with July eighteenth that's being offered to Del Delilah. Right. Yeah, we do have uh, Joshua and Joseph lived 110 years. Um, <clears throat> now, some people would say that's a pretty obscure type of thing to take, you know, the divisors of a number. Uh, but if we remember that we're we're speaking to this movement at this time uh, this is something that we have noted at other times so it may be rather obscure in that sense but it's something that we've already done and it has some, precedence yeah so <clears throat> so it means something to us as a symbol wouldn't mean that to other people so it would show that it is a message to this movement to this time, to us particularly, who would notice this detail. Now, you bring up divisors, and it's kind of interesting because I was having a conversation with another brother this weekend. He was trying to make the point that he was thinking that the five kings were dividing the 1100 pieces of silver amongst themselves so in other words instead of 1100 each king that the 1100 was total of all of them yeah i would why were this, they making that point well my rejoinder to him was that the scripture is very clear where it says, give the every one of us. That yeah. this is each of those leaders of the cities offering 1,100 pieces. 
Yeah, that's, I mean, that's pretty clear from the Hebrew. You know what the answer is, though, right? Right. I mean, it, it becomes that each are, are offering 220 pieces of silver. Right. <laughs> it's interesting that the visor was mentioned earlier to you, Dwight, and then we're talking about it prior to that. I mean, uh, here, uh, Theodore is trying to explain that, the different divisors. <laughs> it is. <laughs> <laughs> I, again, this is another, as as was being pointed out, a very ironic type of a situation. Yeah, ironic's a good word. So I don't, you know, the, the reason that, that I disagreed with my friend was that I don't see these kings looking for restoration with either Samson or with Delilah. That's why the 1100 makes, makes it kind of interesting. But for each of them to offer five times 220, the 1100 is a powerful symbol. Uh, yes. Yeah, except it, it just it plainly is that they're each giving 1100, not 220. Right. But, but it is five times 220 to get 1100. Correct. So, I mean, there is a dealing with the divisor, there. right? So you're dealing with the divisors there of, of this number. Okay. Ron, you were saying something, please. Uh, uh, I, I said it was, it's still there, though. I mean, the, the, the symbol, the, um, the number, they're still there. Yeah, yeah, that's what we understand. Even though the number is 1,100 that they're each giving, we can see that the number 220 is contained within that number. Right. So, and we've noticed this before, that we have a number. Sometimes some of the divisors give significance to that number as well. Did you see the uh, chat? <laughs> no. Read the chat. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 100, 110 stories in World Trade Centers 1 and 2. Times yeah. 2, right? Correct. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so so we know that these this 1100 can be a symbol that that relates to this movement to our lines, to our understanding of our prediction, uh, to the different dates that we have. And, and that's coming from, in this story of Samson, from the Philistines, being offering this to Delilah. So if the Philistines represent something, they can also represent a message. In the symbols, that message has to do with our message. In the moral story, Philistines aren't good. But in this story that typifies Christ, ironically, um, we can see that the symbols point to something within this movement itself. Mm. So now, now we begin after she has been given this enticement. We begin with the story where she begins in earnest to attempt to determine where Samson's strength lies. Okay, now another comment from the chat before I go forward. Very interesting point, Stephen. We add to this the, the 52 plus basement of building number seven so in the total, there would be 273 floors. Now the 52 is from what, Stephen? Yeah, it was a 52 story building and then you had the basement underneath. Uh, so that, had, was, that was a third, that was the third building you're talking about. 
Yeah, this was the building number seven that fell. Right. Several hours after the Twin Towers. Yeah. Okay, so that, that's pregnant with symbolism because that's building number seven. Right. And then we come to this with the 273. <clears throat> so not only do we have the 27th day of the third month, but is that also not the number of souls that we recorded, what, in Acts 29? Acts 27. Acts 27, okay. So we get that number from Acts 27 and from uh, Numbers 3. Number of, the numbers of the Levites as well. That was 273, okay. right? Yeah, so if you have 27 and 3, that's how you remember it. Acts 27, Numbers 3. Okay. Get the number 273. That's an interesting mnemonic. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so, uh, but you're counting the basement of building number seven, but not the basement of uh, the Twin Towers. Probably not, yeah. Yeah, okay. Basement. Um, I'm thinking, wouldn't, wouldn't the basement of the Twin Towers have been like a parking structure, a parking garage? Yeah, that's more the parking garage. Yeah. Okay. So they had, I can't remember how many floors they had. I do know that in, in 1993, on February 26th, they, they took out three floors of the parking garage or, you know, broke through three floors when they tried to take down the towers with the, the van with the explosives. Okay. So Delilah begins her enticements. Delilah said to Samson, tell me, I pray thee, wherein thy great strength lieth, and wherewith thou mightest be bound to afflict thee. The woman has no shame. Samson doesn't realize this. Samson does not recognize it. He has such an attitude regarding his own strength, not that it's given from God, not that it's for God's glory, but that it's for his glory, that she comes at him with a very direct attack. Is there a story here? Is there an example here that we need to pay attention with about how direct she's being? Or do we just look for what the symbol means of Delilah herself? Samson said unto her, <clears throat> if they bind me with seven new cords that were never dried, then shall I be weak and be as another man. Now, this can be new cords. It can be moist green cords. It can be moist green worths. However, we want to see this. Ultimately, isn't it a lie? Yes. <laughs> This is lie number one. Right. <clears throat> then the lords of the Philistines brought up to her seven green cords, which had not been dried, and she bound him with them. So Samson is so self absorbed. Not only does he know this woman is seeking to bind him, he lets her do it. What does that say to us symbolically? I'm not sure how it relates to you, but that's confidence as far as I'm concerned. He, he's, he's confident that they can't stop, they can't do anything to bind him up. He knows, he obviously knows what's going on. 
Right. I mean, she asked him straight to his face. And now this, this, this verse here, they brought him to her and she bound him up. <laughs> this is the, this is the confidence that he had that he couldn't be bound. What do you think? I don't disagree with you. Um, from the chat, um, I don't see how this applies. Totally different. Now, while I was considering, you know, yes, Mrs. White had the vision of the green cords. This, these green cords are representing new cords. They're representing moist cords. They are something that has never been used. That can apply back to Mrs. White's vision of the green cord, but I don't see how that green cord symbolically is the same as, as these, these seven. What is Ellen White's green cord? The vision of the green cord is one <clears throat> where the true believers are having to flee. They are traveling. And as they continue to travel, <clears throat> different things have to, be, have to be left aside. They have to be left by the side of the road. They finally come to a chasm that cannot be crossed by horse, it cannot be it cannot be crossed with any kind of a wagon. There is just a green cord, and the believers have to take the green cord in hand and swing across the chasm. They have to have faith as to where they're going to land. Yeah, well, um, so with uh, in Christian experience and teachings of Ellen White, um, my understanding of the greeting cord is um, is this one. Um, so this is uh, she has a dream of seeing Jesus. This is Christian experience and teachings of Ellen White, page twenty six, and she's climbing this stairway. Um, so this is a different story. Um, I tried to shield myself from his gaze, feeling unable to endure his searching eyes, but, but he drew near with a smile and laying his hand upon my head said, fear not. The sound of his sweet voice thrilled my heart with happiness it had never before experienced. I was too joyful to utter a word, but overcome with emotion, sank prostrate to his feet. While I was lying helpless, there, scenes of beauty and glory passed before me, and I seemed to have reached the safety and peace of heaven. At length, my strength returned, and I arose. The loving eyes of Jesus were still upon me, and his smile filled my soul with gladness. His presence awoke in me a holy reverence and an inexpressible, joy, inexpressible love. My guide now opened the door, and we both passed out. He bade me to take up again all the things I had left without. This done, he handed me a green cord coiled up closely. This he directed me to place next to my heart, and when I wished to see Jesus, take it from my bosom and stretch it to the utmost. He cautioned me not to let it remain coiled for any length of time, lest it should become knotted and difficult to straighten. I placed the cord near my heart and joyfully descended the narrow stairs, praising the Lord and telling all whom I met there, met where they could find Jesus. This dream gave me hope. The green cord represented faith to my mind, and the beauty and simplicity of trusting in God began to dawn upon my soul. So this is what I understand is the story of the green cord. Okay, so am I then conflating or confusing two stories? 
Yeah. Okay. You're referring to the journey where they have a uh, a cord that's that they um, hold on to as they climb up. They need this for support, and then they swing across it when it becomes the size of their body. But I don't know that that's a green cord. Um, no, uh, that was that was let down to them yeah. um, from heaven or from above. It said she said, mm -hmm. and they grabbed a hold of it uh, and swung across. Yeah, well, they had been using it for a while as they were climbing up too. Right, and that was that was the midnight. If I'm not mistaken, that's the midnight cry vision. That's that's the end of the vision where they went where they went over the the drops of sweat that were coming off of them at the very end, and and they had taken their shoes off and their feet were all bloody, and the cord was let down, and then they swung across. Now, yeah, so getting back to the symbolism. James here. first and then her. Yeah. yeah. So the green cord, which is what we're focused on here, um, we have a green bowstring or width that's mentioned, or seven of them that are mentioned. And the question is, can we relate these things to each other? Do they have anything to do with each other? And... Um, um, the thing that we can see about this cord, it needs to be stretched out. And this can represent the lines. And, and she can uh, she could find Jesus by stretching out this cord. If you wish to see Jesus. So, I mean, couldn't this represent the lines? But it also could relate. Yes, it could. Yeah. And it could relate to this story in Samson. I mean, because I believe that these these seven green widths uh, represent the lines. Okay. <clears throat> okay. In in one of the compilations that we call Testimonies for the Church. Testimony for the Church, number two, our second testimony, starting on page 594, is the vision that I was recalling. So, Theodore is correct. Ron is correct. I stand corrected. So now, we have seven green cords. We have the lines. Would we say those seven green cords are the major lines that we would be that we would be looking at? Or is this just representative of the multiplicity of lines that are coming and becoming clear to the movement? Yeah, so uh, which I agree with that latter. Now, um, if we're, if we're going to look at these as the lines and we're going to try to place it within this movement, I mean, it would be uh, the effect of every vision. It would be where we bring, uh, we see all of these lines, but it's the beginning of this understanding because we see this progression in these tests that are being brought. Um, so if I was going to, this is just me thinking here, but if I was going to try to say, where does this represent? What does this represent in this movement? It would represent uh, a point in which we came to understand the lines. So exactly what point that is, I don't know, but it, it would represent that point. That this is a test. And, and so we could liken it to uh, the first angel's message in that, that that's basically what was understood um, in the movement as we came to 2001, right? So we come to these this understanding of the lines. Now, it's not a complete understanding because we still don't have that, but that was what was established in the first angel's message or the repeat of the first angel's message in this movement was the understanding of these lines. And, and it's empowered when Jeff, you know, um, 
publishes the Time of the End magazine. But by then he has developed this understanding of the lines. And so, right. This is this is why we have the lines like this now. It's because of, of Jeff's efforts to understand them. Yeah. In this manner. And, and now we, we have taken that even further. Well, he, he, yeah, and the movement has developed. I mean, and Jeff obviously took it further too after 9-11. That's right. Yeah, so. That was uh, all the motivation for us to continue this stuff. I mean, for me anyway, I mean, it was all of his work that he had done um, that convinced me that there's still, still even more. Yeah. So, so we have these lines being developed. And, and to me, that's what this would represent. So we can take it as the first angel's message in our history. Agree. Okay. Now there were men lying in wait, abiding with her in the chamber. So you have Philistines that are waiting for Samson to be bound and they are within Delilah's house. And she said unto him, the Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he, break, he broke the cords as a thread of tow is broken when it smelleth the fire. So his strength was not known. They had confidence that Delilah was going to get this ascertained quickly. So they had people there. They wanted to prove this. They wanted to put an end to Samson immediately. What symbol is there for men lying in wait? I mean... I look at this and Delilah is as confident in her prowess as Samson is in his strength. Therefore, she's willing to allow the Philistines into her house. She had no fear of the Philistines, even though she lived within the nation of Israel. Symbolically, what does that say about her? What kind of a church is she? A worldly church? Very much. In Israel? Yes. So it's, are we making a connection here? But, but we have to turn this, this symbol on its head. Okay, so if you're going to turn it on its head, how do you see it? Well, this is a good church. Because this, this church, this movement is being offered a message, which is these lines. <coughs> and, and it's all being offered th these symbols, 1,100 pieces of silver which would represent something something in this movement. So even though these are negative things in the moral story, in the symbolic story, they'd have to represent something in the movement. All right, so let's continue. So there's strength in the message. Yes. Uh, we're, we're considering Samson as the message, right? Well, Samson's part of he the message. He's, he's representative of the message at this point. Yeah, the message of July 18th. Right, okay. But, but also, so all of this is representing this movement and the messages in this movement. Right. And we have trouble sorting it through because we have the moral story and then we have the symbolic nature of what's being shown. And now, even though you have this, this ironic story, you can't just take 
everything and say it's the opposite, right? Because it wouldn't make any sense at all. You have to look at what the symbols are, right? And look at how they apply. So, you know, some people would say, well, we have Delilah, you know, she's bad. Um, you know, she's in apostasy, but so is Samson, right? He's bad too. But Samson represents Christ. So Delilah right. must represent uh, a good church, not a bad church. Okay. The ironic portion. Yeah, because when we look at this story symbolically, we we have to ignore the moral aspects of it. Those don't apply. We it's all to... symbolic. Yeah, it's symbolic. So we, we look at it ironically, right? So we, right? We, Samson represents Christ. Well, Christ is not uh, Samson in almost any way. He's and it actually like the opposite of the Christ. Opposite. That's right. But he doesn't represent an antichrist. He, you know, he doesn't represent some evil thing. He's representing Christ. But he's representing this movement and and it's and it's victory as well because we have all of these symbols in the name of delilah in the the, the silver that's being offered and so forth so this has to be some kind of message that's testing both samson and delilah and and samson's of course is a message and delilah would be um a church or this movement in some way but samson also represents the hundred and forty four thousand right so it represents both a message but the message as it affects people because there is a people being prepared because we know the everlasting gospel is a three-step testing prophetic message that develops and demonstrates two classes of worshipers and and so this is about the gospel that's brought here in symbols in this terrible story. But those symbols point to this movement, what's happened in this movement. So Delilah must represent this movement or the church, right? Body of worshipers that is being tested by this message. Now, some people would say, well, this maybe Delilah represents the the conference or church or or Adventists in general or Levites or things like that. But the problem here is all of the, the who's been tested by this message. It's been this movement. And so Delilah must represent this movement. It makes logical sense. Mm -hmm. Hey, so in looking at it in this way, are each of these tests symbols of messages that have tested the movement? Yes, that's that's what I'm saying. They're they're the messages that tested the movement. And if so, three now, different messages. Mm hmm. Yeah. For a second. So, and so is it is it possible that this first test with the seven new cords the seven moist cords could have been the message of joel that tested the movement um well definitely it could be i mean these are bowstrings too which brings us to the archers which are a symbol of islam right it, it would bring us to the lines and these lines then are going to be broken that is empowered in this case at 9-11, right? Okay. <clears throat> so, because we know 9-11 is, is, is the empowerment of the first angel's message, as well as the arrival of the second, but those are two. Okay, so it is, is this first data. message, this first test, 9-11? Well, it's everything that leads up to 9-11, yes. So it's, it's the understanding of 9-11, because 9-11, is really about the first angel's message when it comes to its empowerment of the first angel's message because that's how it was first understood it's symbolizing the arrival of the second um is something that came later right so jeff didn't first you know put 
uh, Revelation 18, uh, 1 to 3, at 9-11. Right? First, he recognizes it has to do with Islam, and that this is going to be a parallel to August 11th, 1840, which originally he had applied August 11th, 1840 to the time of the end in 1989. So now, after 9-11, it takes a couple of years for them to really sort this out, what actually was happening with 9-11. And so this became a test, that acceptance of those lines in the context of 9-11 would be the first test. And the everlasting gospel is a three-step testing prophetic message. So we would have to look at these tests that the movement is experiencing as being that repeat of Millerite history as these three tests. Now, it is also possible that we can take this story and zoom it in more closely to things within this movement from November 9th to December 25th, 2021. Right. So I think both are, are, are probably true because we have a repeat of those messages within the context of July 18 itself. Uh, couldn't the uh, breaking of the cords represent the rejection of the lines? No, because we, we take it to mean the empowerment of the lines, not the rejection. Because we're not looking at the moral aspect of the story. We're just looking at, at what ends up happening. So this isn't people rejecting truth. Samson is Christ. Christ doesn't reject the message. We're look, looking at it as types. Yeah. Not necessarily. It, it's not... It's not that Samson can represent as Samson uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Sorry about that. Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Samson couldn't, Samson couldn't represent the people in the movement. Well, he can represent the people in the movement because as, as we're going to see when we go through the story, we start to realize that Samson represents the message that develops these people within the movement. Because Not even the secondary the sense. Not in the second. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Uh, not even in a secondary sense. Well, yeah. So it, 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 that's what I'm saying. Is Samson is going to represent the hundred and forty-four thousand at the end of the world? Okay. Right. But he. Yeah. But it's it's about a message that develops the these people, right? <clears throat> right. So, so even though it's a message, it's a message that develops and demonstrates two classes of worshipers. That's the everlasting gospel, three-step testing prophetic message. Now, the question is, why does, why does the Bible have this story of Samson in the first place? In its parallels with Christ, something that people have noticed for centuries. So it's not some new idea that this movement came up with. People have noticed these parallels with Christ. So they know Samson is a type of Christ, but he's an ironic type, right? So, so that's well understood. But now we look at the moral story. We know the moral story says one thing. And, and we don't ignore the moral story. It's, it's, it's what's on the surface there in the scriptures. But we recognize that if we're going to look at these types, this has to be representing something good, even though the moral story is negative. So if we're going to look at Samson himself, he has symbols attached to him that we can see represent um, the 144,000. Because the 144,000 represent Christ. So Samson represents Christ, but he's ultimately going to represent the completed work of Christ in his people. And so as we go through the story and we start to look at the symbols, we have to set aside the moral aspects of it and not think of Delilah as bad and the Philistines as bad and Samson as bad. Uh, we have to recognize that they're in their typical representations, they're representing the everlasting gospel and its work upon and its completed work upon this earth.
Okay. Now Delilah comes and presents a second test. And Delilah said unto Samson, Behold, thou hast mocked me and told me lies. Now tell me, I pray thee, wherewith thou mightest be bound. And he said unto her, If they bind me fast with new ropes, wherewith work hath not been done, then I shall be weak and be as another man. So a second time, Delilah is challenging him, is challenging the message to prove itself. If we have 9-11 as the first, the second could be that of Joel. It could be something having to do with another message that the movement needed to be proved with. Where, what would we place in this, in this regard? Well, it would represent a development of the message after 9-11. Okay. Which, so we have seven chords in the first one, but now we have rope. And the difference between a cord and a rope, I guess, um, you know, in English isn't necessarily uh, well-defined because a, a cord. But the idea here is that this is something entwined, right? Right. So it can be translated as cord in English, but the idea of these the the cord there is a bowstring. Uh, now, how is a bowstring made? How were they done anciently? I mean, they're definitely different than a rope. Yes, um, they were some sort of a a flaxen type uh, material but uh, they were slightly bound, but I think they were bound with the, another uh, piece of flaxen um, that, that it wasn't really bound as much as it was uh, circled around over and over and over again, all the way up the, all the, way up the strand, because they had a place, to, they wanted to have an area where the, um, the quill wouldn't uh, screw up their uh, cord, you know, that it was like a reinforcement around it, but they were basically loosely loose all together, but stripped and then hung over something and bound around and let to dry. Okay. Well, my understanding is that they were often, they could be made of different things. Yes. So uh, one would be uh, sinew. Right. Right. So, um, so I, d I don't know specifically how we would um, know exactly what's talked about here, but it talks about basically a, a moist uh, cord, right, that's never been dried. Right. And, and that would be able to describe something uh, that when it's moist is going to be stronger than when it's dried. Right. I don't know particularly whether sin, uh, sinew, you know, animal materials or whatever are going to be uh, stronger when moist or stronger when dried. So I don't know. I don't know enough about it. But the idea is that this is something that's going to be quite strong. Right. So, I mean, it could be plant fiber as well. Plant fiber doesn't pull apart sorry. as easy as it uh it wet as it is dry you know it breaks easily while it's dry when it's wet it just kind of bends yeah but anyway the main thing here is that we, we would see it as something different than rope right but this rope i mean i've made rope before the insinuation is is that it's a piece of it's a little more than thread um, yes 
yeah. as opposed to um, something that's bound or twisted together and then twisted again after making a certain size and then twisting it around something that's the same size. So they, cause they do use multiple layers of these things when they make a, when the word rope is used. Yeah. There's different types of ropes. I, mean, I know quite a bit about rope, um, but uh, so yeah, you can have ropes that have a core that have uh, windings wrapped around them. Right. And then you can have ropes that are just windings in and of themselves. Right. So often it's three sometimes four um, that's right strands so my grandfather had a machine to make rope from twine and there would be three strands and you would just tie these tie the twine to these uh, hooks and then you would turn this crank and the other person would hold the end of these three cords and you'd end up with a rope that's right yeah so um and the twine of course was hemp back then <sighs> Not, not <coughs> plastic. So, um, but yeah, I know also different types of ropes that have used for climbing and things like that. And so they're going to have different types of cores, different ways in which they're done, which they're bound together. So, so rope is something that's entwined. That's the, the nature of the Hebrew word for rope. And so we would consider this, um, the lines that we have would be at this time multiple and entwined with one another. Yeah. So in the past we had these lines that were just sort of each was a separate line that we could lay over top of each other. Yes. But as time went on, we started to recognize that these lines overlapped each other in various ways, that these different way marks uh, and 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 there was different ways we did it. Ultimately we understood that we could zoom into a line and that that one line could have way marks from another line to be a different way mark in that line. So those right. way marks could serve different purposes in different lines. It started to become confusing. People didn't really understand what was happening with the lines. And it, at that point, that's when we started to talk about uh, the comparison of the lines to um, Ezekiel's wheels within wheels, right? Right. So we originally, we didn't have that concept about the lines because the lines were pretty straightforward, simple lines. And we could just right. look on the top of each other. But once we got more, they got more complex. Um, they became more like a piece of machinery in some ways. Where yeah. I think that's what was killing a lot of the people though. They couldn't see the complexity to it. Um, yeah. It's, it's some people can't see those things, but, and it, oftentimes takes somebody to point something out in order to you to be able to see those things. Yeah. So, so when Delilah takes these new ropes and binds him, I mean, we're going to see that, I mean, one is there's liars in wait, which we haven't tried to understand what that means particularly yet. We well, asked somebody him, made that comment. I mean, Dwight made that comment. And the first right. thing that came into my mind was the, the, um, the liars in wait, uh, um, when it was, when they were dealing, I can't remember the exact story, but I remember that there was guys on either side of a road and they were forced to go down this road and they were on either side of them. Um, but they were liars in wait. And this is one of the earlier, um, okay. uh, judges yeah. stuff that we were looking at. Right. Except that the word is Arab. I'm sorry. The word is what? The word is Arab. Arab. Hebrew. Yeah. Such as Arab and Boker? No. Arab. Okay. Like Arabian. All right. The pronunciation sounded the same. No, Arab, Arab is completely different vowels, different. Uh, This is in relationship to those guys that were laying in wait. Oh, well, that's what I would think, whether that's a false etymology or not. Um, uh, but uh, um, it definitely has that, uh, that sort of, uh, it, it looks like it's related in Hebrew. So, I, I'm probably pretty sure that it's related. 
the reason why they would call them uh, Arabians is because of the the way that the Arabians would ambush uh, their trade. But uh, I don't have strong authority, but it is very similar. It's just the same word. You just add a yod at the end, uh, which makes it like uh, an Arabian, right? Right. Um, but anyway, that's what the word liar and wait is. It's Arab. Well, that's what, uh, again, that's just where my mind went when, when uh, uh, Dwight asked about that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what I'm saying is that we could look at this as representing um, even, even if the etymology is false, at least for us, we can take that word Arab and see that it could relate to a message regarding Islam. Right. Could we take the weight as a um, message for July 18th that we had to wait for it to happen? Um, well, I thought about that first. I mean, the word liar and wait is just kind of translating uh, an English, so the word wait isn't really there. Um, the focus is upon an ambush. So, but, but in English, in the King James, they do put the word wait there. So I understand that. So when we're talking liars and wait, we have that example first technically occurring in Joshua and Judges 2037. But we also would see it in Joshua eight nineteen. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We have it in these other stories. So when they're talking about this with the liars in wait, they had liars in wait to go against the tribe of Benjamin. But we also have that here, where they hastened. Because in that story in Joshua, we have this in reference to the people of Ai, right? Mm -hmm. So in, in the first test, Delilah has allowed Philistines into her house to wait so that they could take Samson prisoner. Now we're being told again that there were liars in wait for the second test. Mm -hmm. So they were waiting in vain. How do we turn this upside down? Well, if we're going to look at this movement, it's understanding of the second uh, test. Um, it would have something to do at least with the symbols that we've used for midnight and the midnight cry. So, I mean, we could put this all on November 9th. Right, or the beginning at least of our 777 structure. All right. So that is the message developing from 911 to 119. Okay. Now, 911 originally, I mean, we understood that there was going to be these strikes of Islam. And was 9-11, or 11-9, I mean, to be Islam again, originally? I think that's what we were talking about. Yeah, originally. It, it moved originally, away from that. To it be did a move away, but I think we were originally talking that way. Yeah, before we had it as a date of November 9th. I mean, definitely we were talking about that next way, Mark, was going to be something to do with Islam. We were going to make predictions about Islam, and et cetera. So 
um, with Tess, it turned into this thing about uh, Russia and the U.S. Uh, because of all these different battles, King of the North and King of the South. But, but the idea then is that we had this development of a message. And, and I would say that this, this must be from 9-11 to 11-9. But I could be wrong. Um, I might be mixing up the lines here too. All right. So Delilah therefore took new ropes, bound him therewith, and said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And there were liars in wait abiding in the chamber. And he brake them, the new ropes, from off his arms like a thread. So the liars in wait were disappointed with the second test. Now we keep in mind that the lords of the Philistines have not paid her. All of this is show us that you can get this information and you will be compensated. So now we come to a third test. And Delilah said unto Samson, Hitherto thou hast mocked me and told me lies. Tell me wherewith thou mightest be bound. And he said unto her, If thou weavest the seven locks in my head with the web. And she fastened it, supplied word, with the pin. What is the symbol of the pin? Basically, it, it, it say, it's looking like she is putting all of the locks of his head together, all seven of them. Um, so she's weaving his, his hair into this, uh, uh, the warp, right? So the warp is these um, strings that are laid out that you're going to then weave threads through. Okay. And, and I tried to figure out exactly, you know, these Hebrew words, exactly how they relate to um, a modern loom or, or an ancient loom. It's hard to know exactly, but um, um, you have this beam, which it talks about. Well, here that means a weaving, a braid, also a shuttle, right? So the shuttle, you know, goes through between, takes the other thread and puts it through. That's the, the woof. Um, puts it through the warp. And, and then it talks about the web itself. That's the spreading out, whether that's um, something to do with the machine. So it says here, in, in the sense of spreading out something expanded, that is the warp in a loom as stretched out to receive the woof. So, so the web must be the, the warp and um, the beam would be the, the shuttle and the pin. Um, so it, it's a peg, a nail, a paddle. So that seems to be similar to the beam. So I'm kind of confused exactly which part is which, but there are three parts that are mentioned. And these seven locks then are going to be woven into this, to this fabric. Okay. Okay, so... And she fastened it with Yafed. Hebrew 3, 4, 8, 9. Isn't this the same word that was used for the tent stake when JL uh, basically pinned Sisera's head to the ground? Yeah. But it, it's also Isaiah 22, 23. Um, 
So this, um, I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place, and he shall be a glorious throne to his father's house. Referring uh, to the one that he's going to give the key of the house of David to. I will lay it upon his shoulder, so he shall open and none shall shut, and he shall shut and none shall open. So it would seem to be here that there is a, um, this fastening is with a nail or with this pin. Uh, could in some way relate to a close of probation. Well, we're talking pin, we're talking stake, we're talking nail, we're talking different symbols that, that basically accomplish the same thing. Mm -hmm. So is this pin, as it's presented in this verse, that she is weaving these seven locks. I'm, I'm having to look at those locks as being braids. Yeah, it's possible. That's what they refer to. Okay. But um, the main thing here, whether we want to understand this literally or not, I mean, his hair is being woven into this, this, this material, right? And there's seven there. So we know that that's a symbol of the seven times. Right. And can we see that there's a development of this message um, related to uh, this rather complex structure of the seven times woven into these parallel lines um, that this must relate to the message that we had uh, after 9-11? after 11 9 after november 9th that developed relating specifically to july 18th and all the complexities that we see there because what we see is an increase in complexity right with these different symbols yes and no you say no i i'm saying and no uh, how and no was november Ninth uh, message. Yeah. It was talked about beforehand. Yeah, and ended up being a close of probation, right? So for the false priests. And so I look at what happens in this third test as the development of the understanding of this message in this movement after November 9th. Because it's after November 9th that the movement's going to pick up July 18th. And all of the, so before that, we, we had that, but it was ended up being rejected by Parminder and Tess. Now, Jeff held on to it, but now it's going to be taken up in a serious way within this movement. And, and that's where we get this much more elaborate sort of um, test from the simple chord to seven chords, but still chords, to these ropes, which is obviously chords that then are, are intertwined with each other. And now to uh, this matrix of, of hair and lines and warp and woof, and um, which would much be more representative of the message after November 9th. So I, I have to agree with that. Yeah. So how did you say no, Dwight, that it's less, that it's not more complex? Well, I'm just looking at it in a, in a simplistic manner that the seven um, locks or the seven braids of his head mm -hmm. are representative of the seven times of Leviticus 26. Mm -hmm. And the pin that holds it all together is our understanding of their importance to the movement and to prophecy in general. Yeah. Yeah. So you have all of these are part of this, this structure. Right. Now, the, the pin, the idea of the pin is I think of it still more as like um, a waymark. 
So, so what we have here in, in the English, in the King James, is pin, pin, beam, and web. So if you look at a pin, that's like a way mark. A beam, what would we think of as a beam? A support. Okay, well, a beam goes across. Yeah, but it's, it, it's also support. Yeah, it's yeah, but it's a what what I'm saying is it's a horizontal support. Okay, that's fine. Right. And and then we have this web. And so web is um you can see the simple of this idea of a pin is like a point. A beam is a line. But when we're dealing with the web, what would that be? I mean it says a spreading out and expansion. That that, the, that's the creation that this woman is making from the from the uh, the braids. I mean, I've seen hair that's been braided in some really fantastic uh, models. Um, but if we're talking about the hair or the braids being the seven times, and how all the stuff that we found out that's attached to that seven times, like the 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 four or however many number of um, sets of two fifty uh, three in, in there and how yeah. many of these different things these are this is all those patterns that are being made in this hair design and I believe yeah. that if we're talking about hair and we're talking about that pin I I remember on older photos that I've seen. That women, when they um, um, put their hair up, they use a pin to hold it all. Yeah. Yeah. And so, but yeah, the word web here, though, refers to not the, the hair. This refers to the warp. Okay. So, the warp. It, it, so the warp is the strings that are stretched out. And then the woof is woven, is the threads that are woven between the warp, right? So you have all these strings that are stretched out, these parallel lines. And it's now, still the hair. No, that, that's not the hair. The hair is what's going to be woven through those. Oh, okay. Right, so that's okay. going to be the woof. The hair is going to be the woof in this piece of material. And right. the so nomenclature is, uh, is, uh, is needed to understand this, yes. I, yeah. I, so what yeah. I'm saying is that, that this is an intertwining of the understanding of the 2520. So when we look at the development of this message and I agree. what we came to understand about the 2520, especially as it was de developed in its symbolic structure, um, you know, which is mostly the work that I was doing, right? Understanding these periods of time, this, the, the, the four, seven times, how they were interrelated, and it was because of this study that I ended up with these symbols that were then applied after we brought time setting into the movement, right? So prior to that, we have no time setting. I have all this understanding of the seven times, understanding of Ezekiel, Ezra, all these things and how they relate to the seven times. That's why I'm studying Ezekiel, because I'm trying to understand the chronology of the the seven times in the 2520. That's why I'm studying Ezra, right? So when we get all of these symbols from Ezekiel and Ezra, and, and also from the story of Joseph and from Revelation chapter nine, they all come together in this complex fabric. But it's because of the seven times that we can now weave this into um this web which is these lines that we've been given so i would look at the web which is the warp as representing the parallel lines that the movement had understood but now we're going to weave into that an understanding that is going to be related to our july 18th 2020 prediction specifically it makes sense Okay, good. Symbolically, is this reference to the web a doubling? Symbolically. 
so um, where are you seeing the doubling? What are you referring to? If I'm looking at this correctly, using Strong's, the word for the web, Maseketh, is what Hebrew number? Well, it's 4545. Five. So, so that could be the fifth day of the fourth month. But doesn't 45 also have an interrelation with the 1843 chart? Yeah. Yeah. So it could refer to. Um, um, Good so catch. So we Good look catch. at so we look at it at the midnight cry. Yes. Okay. Which would then apply to July 18th again. Exactly. <laughs> I guess I'm getting more sensitive about things, especially like this number 45. Uh, I'm just happy that you've caught all this stuff. So as we're looking at this, God is showing us that she weaves the seven locks of his head within the web, within the 4545. She weaves the seven times and applies the seven times in line with the midnight cry. Does that mean anything to us at this time? Yeah, and if we're just looking at the Hebrew numbers, I mean, we also have 7218 for head, Rosh. Um, which of course has all the numbers of 1872, just in a different order. Um, so, so we definitely can see that this relates to this message of the seven times and July 18th and the midnight cry in our history. You know, I know that head is such a common word in the Bible, but, but here in the context in which we have it, it becomes significant. In these, in these two verses, Judges 16, 13 and 16, 14, yeah. they are the only verses where the web is being mentioned. Yeah, yeah. So that, that word itself isn't anywhere else in the scripture. So when we're dealing with the 4545 and we're looking at this, with the seven times and the midnight cry, <clears throat> it's something that we need to carefully consider as to how it interrelates with what we are seeing now. That's an agreeable statement. And she fastened it supplied word with the pin and said unto him the philistines be upon thee samson and he awakened out of his sleep and went away with the pin of the beam and with the web so his as i would have to look at this his hair was braided together within the web yeah so yeah so that you have the web which is the warp and his hair becomes the woof all right. Yeah. Now, these are three tests. Three tests that he's been given. My question that I asked on Thursday, given that he's now given, starting in verse 15, he's now going to be given a fourth test. Do these four tests represent in the simple level the messages of revelation 14 and revelation 18 and are they yet again messages to the movement i mean we we've agreed that samson is a message mm -hmm. but are these tests also 
incumbent upon us in the movement to recognize for what they are. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have now this fourth test. Right. And we have to decide what, I mean, whether I'm right about the first ones, the development of the message, uh, this fourth one is, um, he says the truth this time, right? So he's not going to uh, tell her some some tale. He's going to say, okay, here's here's how it is. You have to cut my hair. So we would need to understand what that would mean. Well, I mean, to me, it's it, it is his choice to abandon his vow as a Nazarite. Right, but that's the moral part of the story. So when we look at it in in trying to understand the symbol, we would have to recognize what that would mean for this movement. Is that also not, if we're flipping this on its head, Yeah. his rejection of the character of Christ? So this would be the acceptance of the character of Christ. Okay. Right. This is about the movement reflecting Christ's character. Because it's the opposite. Right. That's what he's been, doing. The story has been consistent in the opposite to represent us. Yeah. Okay. In each of those tests, right? I mean, each one of those, those things um, pretty much happened to us already. Right? Mm-hmm. I mean, if we look at it in, in the non-moral connections. Yeah. But we also know that this, this, the everlasting gospel is a three-step testing prophetic message, the first, second, and third angel's message. The fourth right. message joins with the third and empowers it, right? Right. And, and, the, and what has to empower the message in our movement has to do with the character of Christ in his people. Right. That's why we're not looking for some event to empower the message. We're looking for something that God is going to do in us to empower the message. Right. So Samson, in in this negative sense, shows the opposite of what God is actually wanting to accomplish. So here he's abandoning his role as a Nazarite, but in reality, he's fulfilling his role. Okay. Because of irony. Yeah, because the story is a story of Christ. Christ never abandons his role. He fulfills it. That's right. And that's how we, we are able to understand all the symbology that connects him, his parallels with Christ. Yeah. Okay, Dwight. Okay. We now have just a few minutes left in today's session. We have come to a point that the translators would have said we're changing subject. So we're coming now to Judges 16, 15. We're coming to that fourth test. Now, there have been a couple of comments in the chat that we have not addressed. One that I'm going to ask about very directly, why? Proverbs 31, 13, 19, 22, and 24. I mean, Proverbs 31, isn't that about a righteous woman? Why, why would we look at Delilah in that sense? I was just comparing the, the, the weaver in Proverbs 31. And yes, it is, a, it is a righteous woman, but we're looking at an ironic story. So. Mm-hmm. Could apply. Okay. 
And, and one of the things we see about this, this weaver and the symbols in Proverbs 31 is this is about uh, the church and the truths that are being represented. So um, she maketh herself coverings with tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple, right? All, all of these different things are, you can see all kinds of symbols of the sanctuary of the gospel. So, Amen. Yeah. So here, if we're going to take this Proverbs 31 and we're going to, we know this is a righteous woman. The Delilah in symbol represents a righteous woman. In symbol, she would represent a righteous church. Yeah, a righteous church. Yes. And, um, and so this, so all of these symbols are tied together. I mean, the message of Samson is the message of July 18th, ultimately. But it is also the message of all through here, because Samson is being tested. Uh, so the message is being tested. And then um, he also is going to represent this completed work of Christ in his people. So he's going to come to the Sunday law test. On the big line, um, which is why I say that he represents uh, in this movement, this repeat of history, but he also is going to represent the 144,000 at the end, the people who overcome. And that's why, so I would say that, you know, taking this Proverbs 31 would make sense. Okay. Now, are there any other comments or questions at this point? Anything else we need to clear up at the, from this the meeting today? Uh, yeah. Okay. You, you, still, you still haven't sent me this document that I'm looking at. What? No, wait a I, minute. I, I haven't seen this document that we're looking at. I don't. I don't have it in my possession. Judges 16. Right. Okay. You'll have it later today. Thank you. You bet. Okay. Anything else? Shall we close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven. We thank you for this time that we have spent together in study, considering your word, considering your examples. We thank you for this time of preparation that you are allowing us. Father, please direct us today in all things that, that need to be done. Place us where you would have us to be. May your will be done. May we walk softly before you and understand this which is presented so that we may again, as we come together further, be able to more clearly understand the symbols and the direction that you are giving to us at this time. May your blessing be upon each one. For this we thank you, for this we praise you, now and always, in Jesus' name. Amen.